long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. On this tour today, we will be exploring one of the most underrated Art Deco ensembles in the city, even the most underappreciated one. But before we get started with that, let's get to know the context a little better. Some of you might already know this, but historically, Bombay was a group of seven islands. Many people have been moving to the city in search of opportunities, and this resulted in a need for space. So. Uh, over time, the city actually started to reclaim uh, new land from the sea around it. And this resulted in the formation of a city as we all know it today, one island city. Within this city, we will be focusing our conversation today around this particular neighborhood, the port. Just to orient you, uh, let me walk you through the map itself. On the right hand side, you have the docks, so that is our eastern seaboard, and on the left is the curved, um, the curved line that you see is the marine drive, so that is our western seaboard. Uh, port is situated right in the middle of these two entities, and it is one of the many old settlements of Mumbai. This port was developed under the British rule. It was initially fortified and hence it got its name Port. The port walls were of course demolished in uh, 1862 by Sir Barter Freyer. And this is a map over here that talks a little bit, shows you a little bit more about the port walls itself. Of course, once these walls had come down, you, you, uh, the city used the same lands to build a lot of other buildings but you still can see the remnants of at least the urban form that was once the fort area. And that you can very clearly see in the map on your right itself. Notice that oval oblong shape that is there. That is what was once the fort area. This yellow line that is actually uh, seen over here was this an invisible divide that one could see that segregated the area into two distinct uh, neighborhoods. That is the native side, which was also known as the native town and the European side, which was the European town. Of course, landmarks that one sees today um, do talk about a few of the landmarks that one saw during that time as well. Some of those are the Esplanade, um, which you would see on your map on the left, that ended up becoming the Oval Medan as we know it today. And you had the Bombay Green then, which later now a lot of us know them as Honeyman Circle. And then finally, you also have the Town Hall, which one knew um, if you were visiting the city in the late 19th century. But today, a lot of us know it as Asiatic Society. This is another visual representation of the same port neighborhood that we are talking about. Uh, but this uh, is basically to orient you if you're standing at the steps of the Asiatic and looking outward. Uh, and of course, if you were visiting the 19th century, this is the view that would greet you. Uh, you would see the Bombay Green in front of you and the church gate streets that have been highlighted with the orange line, that was that invisible divide that one could see, um, not only in the architecture, but just in the kind of people who are living in the either side of the port area itself. You have the native side, which had most of the natives living in, and the European side, where most of the European um, lived. Um, this is another example of visual representation of what one might have seen in the native side itself. Here, we're talking about one particular sub-precinct, which is the Bazaar Gate area. 
this area was commercially a thriving area within the larger port neighborhood itself because of its markets and merchants. It was also the headquarters for the wealthy Parsi Shroffs, an Indian community that was responsible for the banking town business in town. By mid 19th century or so, this was the most commercial and vibrant locality within the port. So it comes as no real surprise that the modern financial institutions of the city were centered in this area and PM Road gets constructed in the early 20th century to pass through this particular area. Um, but before we get there, we need to get a better sense of what really happened and how did PM Road really come into existence. So it all actually started in 1896 when Bombay was severely affected by the bubonic plague. This event completely changed the way that Bombay start getting planned in the coming years. I'd like you to now uh, look closely at the image that comes up on the screen. Notice how the buildings have been built very close to each other. There's a lack of cross ventilation. And of course, there would be high density of population, high density of people living in this area. This encouraged contamination and spread. And that is why a lot of care was taken in um, when planning the newer neighborhoods in the latter part of uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. The most positive and direct fallout of this plague was the creation of the Bombay City Improvement Trust. The institution was mandated to improve the city for commerce, provide better sanitation and living conditions. They also did so by reclaiming land, restructuring existing areas within the city, and even doing some suburban development. Um, the 1925 Hornby Ballard scheme was one such scheme that was implemented. And PM Road actually is a part of this particular scheme. Uh, just to give you a context, here is a map of the native side of uh, Fort neighborhood itself. And what you'd see is there are two main arterial roads on either sides of the Fort neighborhood. On your left is the DN Road, also known as Dr. Dada Bai Noroji Road. And on the right hand side is the Shaheed Bhagat Singh Road. Some might even refer to this as the Mint Road. In this, you also need to notice that there are two specific neighborhoods that have been created on either side. One is Ballard Estate which you would see on your right-hand side, and the Hornby Road, which is, of course, the older name of DM Road. This particular PM Road that gets created actually formed the east-west corridor that enabled one person to move from the east to the west in a very easy and convenient manner. What it also did is it actually enabled this whole dense neighborhood to be cross-ventilated by introduction of all the all this thoroughfare. Over here, I'd also like you to notice how all the buildings have been created. All of them are really closely spaced structures. So you actually see a lot of high density population in this area. And then also notice the area uh, where PM Road has actually been created, which is in the lower side of the image itself. Notice how all those buildings are a lot more spaced out, right? So what really happened is the municipality took over three years to demolish around 200 old structures and cut through this really crowded precinct that would have otherwise looked like the upper half of the um, neighborhood. They then created this new road, which is of course the PM road that had footpaths on either sides uh, with over 60 building sites available for frontage construction. By frontage construction, what we really mean is that most of the front facades of the building actually faced PM Road. And what was expected of this area was that this area would rapidly, rapidly develop into a dynamic business street. The road was then finally inaugurated on May 24, 1928 by Dr. G. D. Deshmukh, 
the then president of the municipal corporation. And the road was named in memory of Sir Ferocia Mehta, one of the founding members of the Indian National Congress. Here is another portrait image of Sir Ferocia Mehta. He was also known as the father of the Municipal Corporation of Bombay and was responsible for drafting the Bombay Municipal Act in 1873. During his tenure at the corporation, he actually focused his efforts in key areas of sanitation, health, water supply, creation and maintenance of roads, among many other of his projects. On the occasion of his 150th birth anniversary, a commemorative postage stamp, which you can see on your right, was actually issued by the country. With this context, let's now begin to better understand the built landscape along this particular. We will now begin our walk at the junction of BN Road and BN Road. And over here, we will see three significant buildings that you can now see highlighted on your screen. The first of these buildings is the Bombay Mutual Light Building. This street corner building occupies a unique position in an island site at the junction of BN Road and DN Road. It is also the headquarters of one of the oldest mutual insurance companies. Since its inauguration, the ground floor of the building that you see on this image as well was occupied by the National City Bank of New York. And that bank still occupies this space. It's just that it is known as a very different name, that is the City Bank. So next time you're in the neighborhood, I'm sure you will notice the blue band that runs along the building. Make sure to take some time to actually look up, and this is the beautiful building that will actually be some of the character defining features of this building that you can see in the photograph as well are the deep chajas, the 100 feet high dome, and the ornate relief work on the building. Although over time we have lost the chaja, there are quite other features of the building that still remain intact and can be clearly seen in this. Um, what you also see here is the facade that has been treated with fine dressed mallard cut stone. You also see red color banding. These bands have been created using red sandstone. This is another close up image of the same building. Notice the cable like relief work in the red sandstone on the lower half of the image. This runs horizontally along the whole building. Another detail shot of the same section uh, draws your attention to the relief work that you see on the top part of the, um, the section. This is an off-white or cream color, and one can clearly see the repeated semicircular path, patterns on this relief work. This has been finished in color cream. Another beautiful relief work on this building, the last one I promised, can be seen at the street corner entrance of the building. Our next stop on this walk is the Bai Piros Bai Dada Bai Manekji Pacha Akyad. This, what you see here, is an archival image where you can clearly notice the rising sun motif at the skyline of the building, classical inspired architectural features clad in marbled, colored marble, and typical iconography that you can see in Parsi fire temples across the city. The building still stands intact, actually, and this is an image, a very recent image that we had taken. Notice how almost all the features still are very intact, and it looks just as beautiful as it would have when it had opened the first time. The next building that we are going to be visiting is the Prospect Chambers. This symmetrical in design with numerous chajas, also known as eyebrows, uh, red vertical banded features with chevron patterns, and of course, some architectural lettering is a classic Art Deco building. Interestingly though, this building also houses the headquarters of the Indian Institute of Architects an organization with a mandate to promote the profession. of This is an image of the executive council of uh, IIA from the year 1935 in October. 
since its inception, numerous practicing architects had held important position in the organization's executive council. And by doing so, they helped shape the minds of the students and their career through their outreach work. Over here, though, I'd like to focus your attention on three of these architects' pictures. Starting with the first one, we'd be talking about here is D.W. Ditchburn. He is actually well known for creating the metro cinema that one sees in Marine Land. Another building that he's responsible for is the building HSBC, located very close to the Flora Fountain. So the next time you're in that neighborhood, make sure to look out for this particular building. Our next architect is Mr. C. M. Master. He actually led the architectural department of Sir J.J. School of Art for a few years. And he, he was also the partner of the first Indian architectural firm, Master Sate and Pita. This is one of the buildings from their firm's portfolio. And this is situated at the junction opposite the Church Gate Station. So the next time you're in that neighborhood, look out for the Industrial Assurance Building. Another building that this man is responsible for is the Sunawala on Marine Drive. It is a fine example of a building that uses numerous nautically inspired features and does a great job at it. Finally, the last person I'd like to talk about is Claude Batley. He was a very well-known figure during his time as a practicing architect. He was also the head of the architectural department of JJ School of Art for 20 years. While doing so, he also part, was a partner at the prolific firm of Preston Buckley and He also extensively through various platforms spoke about the need for climate responsive architecture. By that, what I mean is he uh, really championed the effort of trying to ensure that we use natural resources such as sunlight and breeze, cool breeze, to actually move into the buildings and really ventilate our buildings and keep them happy and healthy and safe. This particular building is the work of his firm and it is Ramraj Mahal, situated in the Kulaba neighborhood. Um, it is actually along the road that leads you to the gateway of India. Another building uh, his firm was responsible for is this iconic Art Deco building of the Cricket Club of London. On our walk, the next building that we are going to be talking about is the Syndicate Bank building. This is actually a very interesting building and a special one because until very recently, we considered Regal Cinema to be the first Art Deco building in the city. But it was only in the recent discovery that we found that this particular building, the Syndicate Bank building, was the first building to be built in the modern style of architecture in Bombay. The architects, of course, for this building were Bhedwar and Bhedwar. They are also known to be building um, the Eros cinema that one sees very close to the Church Gate station. And this gentleman over here, Sorabji Bhedwar, was part of this firm uh, particularly, also credited for the design of Eros. The architects of this building actually used breakthrough concepts to build a solid structure with compromise, without compromising on the building's aesthetics. What it also did is that the building actually consisted of a framework of steel that was encased with Borbanda stone and brick masonry. What you will see here in this image is that every image, every detail one could notice in the archival image is still intact. So a lot of the original features have actually remained with this building over time and have been preserved um, in a good way. But while you do that, I will also like to talk about two specific features on this building that are worth noting. The first one is what you see on the top, the angular relief work along the original roof line of the building. And the second one is again, angular features, details that you'll see along the sill level. So which is the lower section of your photograph, 
everything along the floor line just above it. And of course, the relief work in a zigzag pattern on the balcony, building balcony. Our next stop in the walk is actually the junction of Kavasji Patel Road and PNR. It's very interesting to actually note that this area of PN Road is sprinkled with numerous eating outlets. Of course, it's very important to remember that Bombay was built by numerous people who migrated to the city in search of opportunity. However, this particular side of the town attracted a large inflow of dock workers due to the proximity to the docks, of course. These were thin, single men living away from family, which meant that they needed to make arrangements for eating out. This impulse might have led to the rapid increase of affordable housing, affordable eateries in this particular area. And you see all of them highlighted on your screen in the yellow dot. One can actually find a variety of cuisines in this particular neighborhood. This melange of cuisines can be taken as the microcosm of Bombay's cosmopolitanism. This city was and continues to be a melting pot of cultures reflected in the diversity of people, traditions, and tastes that have thrived in this region itself. Our next stop on this walk is Lakshmi Insurance Building. This is another very beautiful Art Deco building. But before we get to it, there's a little bit of a story that I'd like to talk about and emphasize when we are talking about assurance buildings or insurance buildings. Um, it is actually believed that many of the older British insurance firms in the early 20th century were discriminatory in nature. They didn't necessarily provide insurance to the Indian um, natives at that point in time. So from that particular colonial injustice rose this homegrown industry where it actually harnessed the political rhetoric that existed on the Swadeshi movement in an attempt to reverse this inequality. So we had a lot of insurance companies that were coming up that were being built by Indians. This particular uh, photograph that you see over here is of a stone that you see right inside the Lakshmi Insurance Building. The reason I'm pointing this out is, notice over here the transcription of the same. Look at the board of directors over here. Almost all of them are Indian directors. And that is what was happening. Indians were trying to create insurance companies so that they can provide for Indians and Indians could buy insurance at that time. Another very interesting thing to note here is that this particular building was inaugurated by Subhash Chandra Bose on 25th February, 1930. I think Indians were particularly inclined towards Art Deco architecture only because it might, they might have been able to identify from the freshness of the Art Deco style itself. And when infused with Indian elements, it would have really created beautiful um, expression uh, almost acted as a vehicle of self-legitimization. Lakshmi insurance particularly drew from the Indian mythology by turning Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and good fortune, into an auspicious brand. These photographs that you see here are one of the standing fe standout features of this building. They are a magnificent bronze statue of Goddess Lakshmi atop a three-sided clock tower. Another standout feature of the building is the sculptural and relief work inspired by elephants, again, the vehicle of Goddess Lakshmi. One can find them in different areas of the building, and I'll just walk you through the different spaces where you can see them. On your left, what you see is this very geometric and abstract interpretation of a ceremonial elephant. You see this right at the entrance of the building. On your right top, you see again, beautiful uh, interpretation of uh, 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 an elephant uh, right on the roof line of the building itself. And on the right bottom, you see multiple 
elephants actually walking one behind the other, possibly through a forest, as you can see some tree line over there. This beautiful relief work created in red sandstone actually runs horizontally along the face of the whole hill. These beautiful um, relief work were actually created in, by the sculptor V.A. Kama. Another deco jewel that draws from the Indian cultural landscape is our next stop. It is the Western India House. This is a beautiful, this is the beautiful facade of the building. Um, if you are a Bombayite, there's a high likelihood you might have visited this neighborhood uh, of Fort and gone to the Bombay store. The next time you're in the neighborhood and you are at Bombay store, make sure to look up because this is the facade that will greet you. It's interestingly, it, this was also the location for Bombay Swadeshi Cooperative store before Bombay store itself. Some of the other prominent features of this particular building are what you see in front of you, that is the prominent orange band. This band actually accentuates the verticality of the building. And there are two other features that I'd like to highlight on the building itself. The first one is what you see on your screen, the lettering that is right above the building entrance. Notice how it's very sleek and slender in form, and it al almost reminds you of the Art Deco era itself, because it's one of those fonts from that time period. Another one is the relief work that you would see along the building's skyline. This ornamental work represents the Indian agriculture and cottage industry, some of the most important sectors of the Indian economy. So what we do next is let's walk and understand uh, in, in mo a bit more detail this beautiful relief work that you see only on top of this particular building. Right. So we are now going to move from the left to the right, develop a better appreciation of this relief work. So as we move from the left, you can notice the man, a man dressed in regional attire carrying a wooden plow on his shoulder and right before him, you can see sheep and ram. Right after that, you see a sari clad woman car carrying harvest over her head. Then you see farmers using cattle to till their lands. Next, you see women worshiping a, a goddess. Possibly this signifies the celebrations that one sees around the harvest festival. Then over here, you see men carrying tools, men carrying sack full of produce, men pushing carts full of other goods and some machinery that might aid with the post-harvest work. This stunning bas relief has been actually created by modern sculptors N. A. Dere and K. B. Savardekar. Our next stop on this walk is the junction of Parsi Bazaar Street and PM Road. And over here, what the building that we are going to know, talk about is the Warden House. The Warden House is this beautiful building and it was built for the Warden Insurance Company. It actually is a fine example of climate responsive architecture. And if you remember, I spoke a little bit about it previously. What that really means is that the buildings are designed to ensure that all the spaces inside are well lit with natural light and cool breeze flows through the building. Interestingly, in this particular building, the rooms along the uppermost floor of the circular tower, which you see on your left side, were designed for the director's meeting room, as that particular area received a good amount of sunlight. And what that meant is an enhanced presence. Another very striking feature of this building is the architectural lettering that you see on the entrance. Um, the entrance photograph is to your right. That's how the lettering seems at the entrance itself. And then you also see it at the street corner facade, which you can see on your left hand side. And it's been highlighted now with an orange band around. To better understand just the social and cultural landscape of this area, it's important to understand the neighborhood itself, right? 
We are currently at the native side, as I had previously mentioned. And this particular area has three smaller neighborhoods. These smaller neighborhoods are the Pora Bazaar, the Bazaar Gate, and the Parsi Bazaar. And each of these neighborhoods have their own distinct characteristics. What's also interesting to note is that the streets along these neighborhoods actually um, have PN Road acting as a feeder road to fill uh, people into these secondary roads of the neighborhood. What this really does is it actually enables smaller retail and commercial businesses in this neighborhood to thrive, making this a very interesting and very well-connected and integrated neighborhood. Our next stop here on our walk is the junction of Perrin, Nariman Road and PN Road. Here, we'd be talking about three very prominent stone-clad commercial institutions, and they are highlighted here in the, um, on your screen. The first two are PNB House and the Amar Building. Through choice of materials, ornamentation, and urban form, there was a sense quality of stability, you know, strength, reliability, and security that was emoted to most insurance buildings. And these were very important characteristics necessary for financial institutions. And they did so very beautifully through a lot of these interpretations. Another building that emoted these qualities is what you see on your screen, the Reserve Bank of India. This was designed by excuse me, the architects Gregson, Batley, and King with J.A. Ritchie of Palmer and Turner. And this was in our, completed in the year 1939. This robust art, art deco building uses long symmetrical blocks of mallard stone to create a very solid, strong facade. And you see that very evidently in this image. Another interesting tidbit about this building is that the largest uh, window assembly in India is seen on this particular building. It is the, the, the details that you see in the darker color, and they are actually total large universal sections that can be operated by gear. These window sections are also made rust proof by the zinc process. Uh, highlighted in orange here is a small detail that I like to talk a little bit more about, and this is what it is. Notice how the ornamental cast mullions and the breast panels here, these are some of the smaller details, finer dis details that add an artistic flair to an otherwise very modest and robust building. It's also very important to talk about this one particular community. Right? It's hard to miss because their presence and influence is very evident in the built landscape of this area. Some of the tangible markers seen so far along the walk uh, that have an influence of this community are the Bai Piros Bai Dada Bai Dada Boy Mani Ji Vacha Gyari, and of course the Parsi Bazaar. But what you see over here, the three yellow dots are some of the other markers that have, um, you know, highlight the role and influence of the Parsi community in shaping the city. But what's also very important to note that these are not just Parsi landmarks. These landmarks are a very integral part of the neighborhood's identity. So to begin with, let's start getting to know them a little better. The first one is the Rutonsi Mulji Jetha Fountain. This was recently restored by architect Vikas Vilavi. It was originally built by F.W. Stevens in collaboration with John Griffith, the head of JJ School of Art. The fountain was actually dedicated by the businessman philanthropist Ruthon C. Mulji in the memory of his young son who died at the age of three. Constructing fountains to provide free drinking water for not only people, but animals, such as in this case, was a very unique display of philanthropy, which was exclusive to Bombay and very unique to it. 
The second one is the Manikji State Akyari. This fire temple on the Bazaar Gate Road adorns the classical features um, and a lot of iconography that you would see in a lot of um, fire temples of this time. Uh, interestingly, this was built in the 18th century and is known to be the second oldest Akyari in the city. Finally, the third landmark is the Bomji Homosji Vadia Clock Tower. This was built in the memory of a Parsi shock philanthropist. The clock tower actually has, was a very functional landmark at that time. Watch was a luxurious commodity and not everyone had an access to it. So having landmarks such as these um, clock towers made time accessible to all. This landmark was also very recently restored by conservation architect Vikas Dilavri and UDRI, the Urban Design Researchers. My next stop on this walk is the United India Life Insurance Building. Prior to this building construction, uh, this site was actually leased to circuses and carnivals. Uh, however, when in 1938, this particular building was completed and we, since then we have United India um, situated very strongly and prominently on this site. It was built by architects Iyengar and Menzi. And some of the striking features of this particular building uh, that immediately catch your eye are the red bands and the architectural lettering, which is highlighted here in the photograph on your right. Some of the other features of this building are the step profile with marble cladding seen uh, at the entrance of the building itself. Notice how it very beautifully frames the entrance of the building. Um, you also see in this photograph, uh, the details that you see on the marble cladding relief work itself. The relief work, if you notice, of the center has a lot of floral designs and on either side actually has frozen fountain details. Stone relief work can also be seen in this particular um, relief work that one sees inside the building. The imagery on this relief work actually draws inspiration from the nautical theme, uh, possibly to signify its location in a port city such as Bombay. Other than the name of the building that is United India, the products also that were installed in this building express solidarity to the independence movement, the Swadeshi movement at that point in time. Uh, lighting fixtures, such as the Mysore lamp, which you see over here, highlighted in orange, advertised um, the use of Swadeshi products. And these products were installed in the building itself. Uh, this is basically um, the blown up version of the advertisement that you uh, just saw. Uh, notice how they talk about the Swadeshi lamp itself. They say these Swadeshi lamps are economical on the current, yet provide an abundance of enduring bright light, almost making you want to buy such products, right? And make sure you use them in your building itself. Our next stop on this walk is at the junction of Shaheed Bhagat Singh Road and the here you see our next building, very prominently situated, the Grisham Assurance House. Uh, this building belonged to the Grisham Life Assurance Society. Limited. And some of the striking features of this building are its position as a street corner facade, the um, classically inspired features such as the dome and the columns, and of course, the architectural lettering that you see on the building. On your left, notice we've highlighted them in uh, orange color, uh, orange boxes. Um, but I'd like you to uh, like to draw your attention to one particular uh, lettering that has been also highly featured in the right hand side. This is again a very beautiful uh, expression of um, architectural lettering used to sort of brand the building itself by Keisha Mishoran. It's also very important to um, sort of remind ourselves that PM Road 
was not only built uh, to house all these beautiful buildings, but PM Road was built to be one of the thoroughfares that enabled east-west movement within the city, right? So what really happened is that one could actually very easily now move from Ballard Estate on the east to Hornby Road on the west, it using the PM Road. This enabled a uh, movement of various automobiles as well um, that in the earlier 20th century were a very important part of the modern Indian lifestyle. So of course, if you see so many beautiful uh, vehicles on the road, there has to be some uh, buildings that were built that would serve as these beauties, right? That is actually our final and next stop. It is situated in the neighborhood of Ballard Estate, and it is the only surviving petrol pump in the city called as the car fuel service station. This is a beautiful image of the service station itself. And what you see here is the wide octagonal cantilevered canopy that has been built in Reeves post concrete. And it forms the roof of the central kiosk of um, the service station itself. This is another beautiful image of the same service station. And notice here that the central kiosk with its cantilevered canopy highlighted in blue, um, and it actually has a tower on it uh, that forms the highlight of the whole design. Notice how this particular tower also has stylistic features such as a curved form, um, along the fin-like feature and the blue speed lines on its star um, that draw inspiration from the aerodynamic principles of automobile design. Um, what you also see um, in this particular photograph at the back are horizontal red bands that run continuously along the top edge of um, the service space, which form um, air spaces on the outer side um, around the central kiosk. Some of the other highlighting features of this particular building <coughs> is the window grill um, that you see right over here on the left that is designed to resemble the headlights and the radiator grills of the car from the Art Deco era. And of course, the original star-shaped terrazzo flooring. Mind you, this was cast in C2 and it has been beautifully maintained and shows very little sign of any wear and tear over these last years. While we talk about this beautiful building, it's important to also acknowledge the person who was behind the design itself. G.B. Matre photographed here. Um, his firm, Architectural Studio, was appointed to design this view, this tool. Here, what you also see is the original drawing of this particular building. This is hand-drawn and hand-rendered. And notice how it has the character-defining features represented in great detail. Here, what you also see is another hand-drawn, hand-rendered view of the site uh, from the original drawing set. This along with this archival image that you see on the, uh, on the right, showcase very different views of this property. Views that cannot be enjoyed in today's time only because there's a beautiful tree uh, right in front of the farm. But in this image, both these images, notice the height of the clock tower and its presence, the presence it commands in the neighborhood among all the other buildings. This beautiful building was actually formally inaugurated on 3rd October, 1938. And it was actually built for the gentleman that you see on your left here, uh, Mr. Late Gabriel Sequera with his wife, Teresa. They are the people who commissioned the work. And interestingly, Gabriel remained an active part of the car fuel business, visiting the pump regularly until his death at the age of 19. The name Car Fuel, though, was chosen by Teresa. She was in charge of preparing all correspondence with Car Fuel clients and associates and was responsible for the bookkeeping. Here on the right, what, whom you see are Daniel and Kevin Sequera. 
Daniel is the grandson of Gabriel and Kevin, his son. They are now uh, the people who are actively engaging in their family business and running car fuel. And uh, all of us know it and cherish this place because of all the efforts and work put in by the father and son. What's also important to know is that while it served a lot of cars in the past, over time, the business has actually evolved and they have expanded their enterprise to ensure that they provide service to every motorist in town. So mind you, you could get your bikes here, you could get your cycles here, you could get your cars, you could actually come and visit this space with any motorized vehicle that you have in your home. But that's not what makes this place unique, right? It, this place is very unique because it's like no other petrol pump in the city or even country for that matter. That's because it has stayed true to its founding values and the family, the owners, give a high regard for, have a high regard for the architectural legacy they have inherited. And to this effect, they have actually converted one of the bays in the station into an exhibition come uh, community space. They actually did this for the 80th celebration, but mind you, you can still go and visit it today because they have retained it. What you would see when you enter this beautiful space is a walk down the memory lane. You get to know how it was built, who built it, why they built it, how it thrived as a business in the city, how they made it, what they used to make it, and all these very interesting memory uh, uh, memorabilia that you would see from this um, business, city business. So what I would really encourage you to do is the next time you'd like to fuel your cars or you're visiting this particular neighborhood, possibly to eat brunch at Britannia, make sure to stop by this beautiful family business uh, and see uh, the only surviving petrol pump, Art Deco petrol pump to be specific, in the city um, with your own uh, eyes. And mind you, it would be a real shoot for you. So with this, I'd like to end our walk today. Mm -hmm.